the next case is Joe Mice v. Garland from the Fourth Circuit at the end of March. And these, this one and the next one are both from episode of 100 of the podcast, which, wow. which is crazy. Well, it's a reminder that this is, you know, you do a full in-depth review on immigrants. Yeah, of the list of stuff I'm supposed to say at the beginning of the episode. You don't to, have to say that. Yeah, no, I do, I do. This is important. So one of disclaimer, this is not a 10th grade individual legal guidance, which I always forget to say. But uh, more importantly, uh, Immigration Review Podcast uh, is one of the top immigration podcasts out there. Um, I'm lucky to say number one is usually uh, that immigration says toolbox, but it's more, more, well, it's more topic. So it's very, maybe more niche for a super niche topic like yours to be pretty much number two up there and you're beating sometimes being number one is it's just a testament to how hardcore your fans are. Um, you must have like a dedicated audience that goes to every episode, and gets your numbers up, but check it out. Immigration review podcast. Uh, with I, I got you. I'm happy to be number two to you forever. That's fine with me. I just want to beat the ones that are about like immigration news, immigration gossip. I just want to beat them. Like they yeah. don't, I got it. We got immigration law. That's what we yeah. should be on top. That's, that's, that's why I want to be. Make sure I have this good. issue because on YouTube, like my channel's growing. I have like 12,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel, this and that, but it get decent views. I get business from it, but like, it like they, they get views you got to talk about the gossip and like one thing is there's a new bill that passed through congress it's probably never gonna happen or if it does who knows what it's gonna look like um at the starter act like they're gonna try to keep these visa numbers or something like that um have you pay extra money so that you could deal with country country limitations or something but like they get so many views when you talk about it but it's like clickbait like and yeah. i see people get views but i'm like i don't want to do that i just want to talk about this is what happened this is us guys did this we know things we know. I don't want to talk about maybe DAPA will come back. Maybe it's like, okay, like it just, it, it, it's Yankee to tail the audience. So, but it will get a bit more business probably. So maybe I should just do it. But I don't know. But I, I hear you when you say that's so not gossip. It's just about, Hey, what are we doing? How do we get this business and law going? Stay pure, John. Stay pure. <laughs> it's like these uh, artists who are, that don't want to sell out kind of thing. Yeah. You ever listen to Tool? No. Yeah. You know, he has a song. It's incredible. They have a really awesome intro, but he's he's like a kid goes up to him and says, you guys sold out. He's like, dude, I sold out way before you even knew my name. So what do you say? You know what I'm talking about? I don't know. I don't know that. I can't imagine telling Maynard that you guys sold out either. So, uh, you know, (laughs) Tool Rocks. (laughs) <laughs> i disagree they didn't sell out no it's just like they're like they're, it's called i think it's the end of my album or end of a song but it's just, if you're into music that song is just off the hook bitch mental and stuff but it's, this kid comes up to him as they call themselves they do like you don't even know how else to get where we're going you have to do a million different things to get the, the system going but um he was actually a guy was on uh was it him on joe rogan's podcast really interesting he's into wine now and stuff it's really random he's like a wine guy but sorry go on that tangent but um so sorry so second it's four circuit you're saying <laughs> yeah well, i mean if maynard is into wine now i mean that is kind of sellout for heavy metal but i'm also into wine and i love tool joel mice v garland fourth circuit and you know yeah we can talk about this because i really did the holdings are what's interesting this one it's amusing i enjoy it it's statutory text so it's always fun yeah um a 237A1H waiver is an immigration court waiver, essentially for LPRs who got their green card through fraud. It's usually how it works. Let's out. talk about it. this. Is a really important subject. It took me like five years of practice. I was randomly at an ALA conference and someone mentioned this. I'm like, oh my God, there's a thing called 237A1H. The best. It's, it's, it's incredible. So, like, imagine you're, uh, you get your green card based on, like, uh, you know, being that uh, unmarried adult child of a green card holder, but you're really married. If you get the green card, they put your removal for that, and you're at that point have a qualifying relative. They could just fix everything up as if nothing happened. So that's actually exactly what happened to Mr. Jalmice. That oh, is what he was. He came as the he came as the unmarried child of a U.S. citizen into the U.S. and he was married. We see it a lot with marriage fraud, which of course you don't condone, but it's available if you are otherwise eligible for a green card. Um, you know you don't have the, maybe a convictions and all that stuff. It's a waiver and it doesn't have a hardship component, unlike pretty much every other waiver component yeah. under immigration law after IRIRA's change in 97. So it's a favorable waiver, but you do have to have a qualifying relative, a U.S. citizen or LPR, I believe, parent, spouse or child. Yeah, all the all three qualify. You just have to have them. Yeah. And then it's up to the judge, like as a matter of discretion, like old 212C. It's just, you know, balancing and weighing the factors. Well, Mr. Joel Mice came as the unmarried son he was married committed fraud put in removal proceedings flat out 237 a1h fact pattern 
but his father dies <laughs> either during removal proceedings or beforehand. And so that was his only qualifying relative because he didn't have U.S. citizen or LPR children or a U.S. citizen or LPR spouse. And I guess his mom wasn't a U.S. citizen or LPR. And the Fourth Circuit said, it doesn't matter. You just have to you have to be, and I, the, the, the text is important, so let me read it. The waiver is available to a non-citizen who is, quote, the son or daughter yeah. of a citizen of the United States. Incredible, yeah. And the fourth said, you remain the son or daughter of a U.S. citizen, even if the U.S. citizen is dead. I mean, the focus is on the non-citizen, not the parent. And so... Incredible. Uh, Mr. John, and, and the fourth, and the oil was saying, well, this is all about family unity. This is ridiculous. And the fourth circuit said, citing Denise Chavez, we don't care. The statutory text says what it says. Now they quote, and so it's very amusing. It also is contrary to matter of Federico, where the BIA apparently in 2008 said the exact opposite. So, you know, that's not good law in the fourth circuit. And here is your guidepost to challenge it in all the other circuits. Um, and let me just look at my notes. It looks like the Ninth Circuit has ruled similarly. So it looks like the Ninth and the Fourth, you can have a dead parent and still qualify for 237A1H. As I said on my show, you know, God, I, I see, God forbid, but I see no reason why the same rationale based on how the statute is written wouldn't apply if you have a child who passes away, which obviously you're not wanting. But yeah. if it happened, it looks like they'd probably still be qualifying relative maybe although the fourth circuit said this doesn't count if you have a divorced spouse <laughs> because of the way it's written that a divorced spouse is no longer a spouse is what the fourth yeah. circuit said so not the same logic although i think they're a bit unclear if your spouse passes away i mean if your spouse passes away is the spouse still your spouse yeah um they seem to indicate no but it's there anyway the interesting case if you only have one qualifying relative and that qualifying relative passes away, don't commit fraud to get your green card. But if you do 237A1H. And, and the cool thing about it is once you keep your green card, like it, it's as if the green card is never taken or anything like that. So your admission is the same. You could, because a lot of times this issue will pop up when people do naturalization pro same particular yeah. and they discover it. So you go to court, fix it. They could turn around and file for citizenship right there. They, uh, it's, uh, they keep the five years and all history, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So not legal advice. I, I'm almost positive that yes, that they USCIS can't, you know, say you're not lawfully admitted if an immigration judge has said otherwise. I would, I, I would have to do more research though on, you know, would it indicate bad moral character if committed, if the fraud was committed within five years, for example, yeah. could they try and get around it? Because yes, you were admitted. Yes, this was waived but we still think you have bad moral character. Could USCIS turn around and do that? I'm not sure. It would be a lawsuit. Um, you know, USCIS is going to do USCIS things. Yeah. At the very at very least, you keep you retain the initial admission date. So Absolutely. Comes, you don't have to wait the, yeah. the, the timing period for citizenship. Uh, you know, I, I never needed a handle case. I like never will because I'm going to take a case that has these kind of, have one or two that may have this situation. But uh, I got so fascinated with it. I spent a godly amount of time reading every single circuit case that ever existed on 237 h and its predecessor statue uh, for, for a couple months. And I had this 150 page ebook I wrote and yep. then I came wow. to proofread it. And, and I was like, I, I, I'm going to throw up if I read this one more time. And it just sat there. I was going to give it to Sabrina Damas to, to, to do it. And then uh, I just lost track. So it's, it's there and probably outdated, but every single case. And I was like, this is such a fascinating statue. The history had to do with world, world war and like people who had, like war experience but they didn't admit to it in the, in the case and like i was like damn this is so magical to have this uh yeah. it's a weirdly statute too because it says like obviously there's fraud and there's a thing called if you didn't do a department of labor or something properly it's, it's like a double thing that they watch yeah, yeah i'm not so familiar with that component yeah we do, we do do the 237 a1h's a lot although those are the type of clients that we do often get i'd be interested i can't believe you wrote 150 page Essentially, I copy paste it every case, and then I near oh. I did an IRAC each one that I ended up being 100 pages, 50 pages. Then I'm like, this is not legible. About to create some sort of this and that, and then by that time, uh, after like 100 hours into it, I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just let it go. It's like eight years ago or something. Um, because there was issues about like the statute says it's for people. Essentially, it words it in the way that looks like if you did consular processing, you could do it, but not if you did adjustment status. 
I disagree. Uh, and so yeah, you can do it. Thing. Yeah, yeah you can do adjustment. Thing. Yeah, it, there was a PI decision, PI or yes, yeah, that that kind of said that, but the way the statutes written, it made it sound like it. So that was an argument for many years, like. Oh, you didn't adjust. It doesn't work for adjustment. If you did admission, like that, they said it's all the same. Like this, th these word things don't make a difference. So, uh, very fascinating. This immigration law, so many like little things. You can make a career off two thirty one eight one eight. Just like market that and then travel the country arguing this this fact pattern, and you can make a six figure salary probably if you just put yourself out there. So. It's a it's a dangerous thing though too. I mean, because no immigration judge is going to grant a two thirty seven a one h waiver unless you admit what you've done. Some people don't believe that what they've done is committed fraud, and some people don't want to admit it. And you you're putting yourself out there. It's discretionary, so you're it's definitely it's dangerous. But you yeah. know, if you've done you know, it, some people have gone around with they they like uh because uh, my research I was asking people. Some people say we don't admit, and the judge so this lets it go. But it, it yeah. is, is like you have to sub, say what the fraud was in paper. But some day, some people like we let it go. But it's gonna be like the judge just doesn't care enough. But yeah, for the most part, that's something you have to like put it out there so you can take it back. Yeah. But it's, random lawyers have said we've done it without that. But it's just one of those things that it's always different kind of thing.